I'm particularly grateful that we remember Baptist, my good friend, who died on the day when the four nuns were killed several decades ago and um, who followed his uh, new political theology, which turned into liberation theology. One of the nuns was my student in Marinol, so I remember this day in a double way now. Also, he died at the beginning of Advent, which was the core of his uh, new political theology. I would like to uh, make a few, I would like to talk a few minutes um, on Marcuse and then a few minutes on Bloch. Um, I want to do this from the perspective of our <coughs> critical theory of religion, which we have developed in the last 50 or 60 years, and Dustin has participated in this very much so. And uh, we try to stay uh, close to the first generation and then from there uh, try to apply it to the uh, present. So, but I would like to go back to Marcuse, who was maybe the least religious of all the uh, critical theorists, and then uh, to Bloch, um, who was maybe the most religious. Now, Marcuse was a real member of the Frankfurt School, but Bloch was close to it and influenced many of them and were helped, was helped by them. So um, I would like to say a few things here about those two. Um, so in the, and I would like to do it in the uh, discourse, uh, the discourse from the perspective of the CTRS, that is our critical theory of religion. Um, and this theory was in discourse with the great Marxist philosophers, Herbert Marcuse, Ernst Bloch, and Theodor Adorno. And um, according to Marcuse, libertarian radicalism seemed to connect Marxism with a quite different Western tradition. In Marcuse's view, this Western tradition would be not so much the liberal tradition. The liberal tradition still contained much of the regressive Puritanism with which it was originally uh, connected and out of which it developed. This Western tradition embraced rather the great radical heretical Christian movements of the high and late Middle Ages. They have since the 12th century centuries become an essential element in the Western tradition. Libertarian trends in Christianity, libertarian humanism, brothers of the free spirit, Edomites, and so on. <clears throat> While for Marcuse, the Marxian theory remained unreconcilable with Christian dogma and its institutions, it found an ally in those tendencies, groups, and individuals committed to the part of the Christian teaching that stood uncompromisingly against inhuman exploitative power, the private appropriation of collective surplus labor in all its forms of slavery, feudalism, and capitalism. In the 20th century, these radical religious tendencies have come to life once more in the priests and ministers who have joined the struggle against fascism in all its forms, and those who have made common cause with the liberation movements in the third world, particularly in Latin America, in Central America, and in Africa, and so on. The martyrized <clears throat> Father Delp, or Dietrich Bonhoeffer, or Archbishop Romero, and his liberation theologians and members of the basic Christian communities. They were part of the global anti-authoritarian movement against this self-perpetuating capitalistic power structure, East and West, which has been less and less interested in human progress. This anti-authoritarian character brought to life long forgotten or reduced anarchistic religious and Christian heretic tendencies, which provoked the authoritarian state and church and Constantinian church, which unfortunately still um, continues in spite of all the hopes which we had since the Second Vatican Council that this would change. The um, critical theory of religion took very seriously even the bizarre extreme forms which the student opposition and revolution took and assumed in the 1960s, and we were very much part of it. The critical theory of religion was deeply involved in the youth movement of the 1960s, which was very much motivated by the Frankfurt School, but also became alienated from it because it was not revolutionary enough for the rebellious students. 
I always wanted to make sure that the students knew well the system which they wanted to change and that they practiced dialectic as determinant or concrete negation through being critical of the systemic negativity while retrieving at the same time whatever had been good in the old system and that they did not risk life and freedom in vain. Authoritarian civil society, liberal state and church repress the fact that the young militants and revolutionaries, Bakuninists mostly and Marxists, had, less, uh, had lost patience with the traditional forms of liberal opposition which go on and on even today in 219 without really changing the liberal essentials. These liberal essentials go on and on still sustaining the urban and rural slums and the ghettos still sustaining and even extending the poverty and misery, no matter which of the two bourgeois parties were in power, Republicans or Democrats in the American Congress, and of course there is no Labour Party. These liberal essentials still go on while hundreds of people are daily killed and tortured and burned in um, immoral and illegal regime change and throne wars and their massive collateral damage. If people like it or not, this post-liberal opposition continues to exist today in 219, even long after the student revolution of the 1960s, which was crushed by the Nixonian counter-revolution, for instance, in the form of young democratic socialists preparing for the next presidential election of 2020, to some extent lead and motivate, led and motivated by the Jewish uh, uh, Senator Bernie Sanders. In the perspective of the critical theory of religion, informed by Marcuse and other critical theorists of society, there is indeed a force in this post-liberal opposition with which religion and the churches should pro properly come to grips because there is a strong moral element in it which has for too long been neglected or overlooked or repressed. This moral element is more and more becoming a political force, particularly against the new right-wing extremism, authoritarian populism, and identity politics, fascism and neo-fascism, and particularly Trumpism, insofar as it has not been weakened to the, um, by the victorious neoliberal counter-revolution of 1989. Marcuse had fought most passionately the conservative or counter-revolutionary Roland Reagan in Paris and in California until he died and his opponent won for the time being. With Reagan, who called himself, like Hitler before, the most conservative revolutionary, that means counter-revolutionary, personal autonomy triumphed over universal solidarity, communitarianism over cosmopolitanism, Friedman over Lord Keynes, the non-constitutional contra-affair over the socialists and Sandinistas in Nicaragua. I would like to um, move to the uh, um, end of my thing, which would be concerned with Bloch, and um, particularly Bloch's uh, dialogue with uh, Moldman. Um, the critical theory of religion is concerned, of course, with the antagonism of the religious and the secular, and specifically then uh, with Metz and Moltmann on one side, or with Eugen Kogon, the author of the ESS state, and Walter Dirks on one side, and then Hockham and Adorno and the other critical theorists on the other side. So, as far as Nobloch is concerned, in reference to the Theologia Crucis, as we have it in Paul, or as Moltmann represented, or the Escatolia Crucis, and that is, of course, the theodicy problem which was mentioned already. Bloch remembered the Orthodox Christian poet Fyodor Dostoevsky, who viewed Christ with great love and his most religious novel, The Brothers Karmasov, which also betrays his familiarity with Roman Catholicism, to which he came through his acquaintance with Polish Catholic convicts during his stay in a forced labor camp in Siberia. Here in Dostoevsky's novel, The Brothers Karamazovs, a discourse take, took place between Ivan and Alyosha Karamazov in the tavern where Ivan talks about the Golgotha, 
in Hebrew, the, in Hebrew or Calvary in Latin or Skull Hill in English, of a Russian farmer woman whose children had been torn to pieces by the blood bloodhounds of her gracious and merciful feudal lord because of no reason at all. The mother stands at the scene weeping and crying and screaming and shouting. If now, so says Ivan Karamazov, the last judgment comes and everything will become clear and everything will be harmonized and all sing, not only the angels, but all the redeemed people, the saints are singing, just are you, Lord, because manifest have become all your ways. And also the mother embraces the landowner, this beast which let, let tear to pieces her children, because all has become manifest and all serves for the best and for the good, then I, as a man of honor, will not join in or take part in this jubilation. As men of honor, so Ivan Karamazov says, I shall reject the entrance ticket to the day of judgment because the children's tears, tears have not been purchased out, atoned for, and expiated. When all this misery and cross and blood and murder was necessary as fertilizer and manure in order to fertilize the harmony of judgment day, then I, Ivan Karamazov, say that I do not consider this worth because the children's tears have not been bought out and, and atoned for. The critical theory of religion is aware that there were also innocent children already in Sodom, and that when Abraham bargained with the angels or messengers of Yahweh concerning the rescue of the city, the innocent children were not even mentioned or considered. The innocent children of Auschwitz and Treblinka of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and of Dresden, also their tears have not been made good yet and atoned for and expiated. The critical theory of religion takes the great Orthodox Christian Dostoevsky, Golgotha, or Calvary most seriously in its ambiguity. For Bloch, there was also this reaction of the Christian Dostoevsky, which went against harmonization and which did not make peace with the cross. In general, so Bloch remembered, there was, after all, in the history of theology, still another theology of the cross than the Pauline one, with Marcion and even with Gregory of Nyssa, a more perfect man. With them, there existed a theology which pointed in the direction that all that evil in the world did not come from the Lord, from God, but that it has been sent by Satan. Here also again the light has been crushed underfoot by the positive apologists, the counter-reformation and counter-revolutionary conformist theologians. The critical theory of religion is very sensitive for such mistakes in the history of the church and of the dogma and of morality. The Marxist bloc rejected the positivistic that may be but theology, the um, uh, it says that what well, may be admittedly not be beautiful, but think of the good which exists beside it. Maybe you become particularly worthy of the good as you take the suffering upon yourself. Maybe Golgotha, but after two days comes guaranteed the resurrection. Calvary was necessary in order to mobilize the resurrection, because otherwise that would not exist. Admittedly, the crucified Christ walks through hell, but the punishment of hell are eternal. For Jesus, who came for a visit into hell, the punishments are not eternal. For the others, they are eternal. According to Bloch, that was a dogma of the church. The critical theory of religion has noticed that fortunately the church does no longer talk about Christ's descendants into hell, but rather to the dead. The eternity of hell was a great problem for my friend Walter Dirks, the great European journalist. Eternal punishment in hell would be too much even for Adolf Hitler. In any case, it would be the absolutization of the theodicy problem. It would never be resolved, not even by the merciful God of the prodigal son. Some people would never be mediated 
and reconciled with God, and uh, he with them, and would eternally remain alienated from him, and he from them. For Bloch, all these theological teachings were also always political means. Therefore, it was Bloch's suspicion that they were taught in order to guilt some, guilt something, or in order to gloss things over, in order not to get to the bottom of things, in order not to call things by their name. In the apologetics, in the theodicy, in the apology, apology of the negative, which is highly justified as political means on the basis of an instrumental functional rationality. When we cannot justify the negative by understanding and reason, then in the holy other, the thing, the negative, dissolves into lemonade. In the view of the critical theory of religion, here Bloch criticizes even Adorno's and Horkheimer's definition of theology and religion as the longing for the totally other than the horror and terror of nature and history. Bloch was against any lemonade theology and religion. Also, the critical theory of religion is against any positivistic lemonade theology. It is as it is. The glass is still half full. For the theologian Moltmann, it was not sufficient to take the nothing ook on, that is the nasty nothingness, and the power of the negative into the principle of hope, as the Marxist Bloch did. How is it with that what is no more? The Marxists who sacrificed their lives for the liberation of the working class from the private appropriation of their collective labor and from their consequent non-recognition and degradation like Marxists and Engels or Lenin or Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht and for the realm of freedom on the basis of the realm of necessity, but never saw the latter realized and never reached and enjoyed it. Paul founded a com the uh, Paul founded a community. Um, well, Paul, fa Paul, according to Boltmann, Paul founded a community out of slaves and free people, in which this difference of slaves and masters was superseded. Certainly and admittedly, Paul was not concerned, like Spartacus a century earlier, to bring about this change through the violent abolishment of slavery. According to the critical theory of religion, slavery still went on for four centuries in the Roman Empire until it was superseded by feudalism in the European Middle Ages and later on by capitalism in modernity. And so did the private appropriation of collective labor by non-workers as a matter of fact up to the present 2019. But according to Moltmann, Paul established nevertheless the foundation for the possibility that slaves and free people, men and women, high and low classes were together in one community in which the differences were no longer valid and have topped off and broken away. Uh, so Paul stated in his letter to the Galatians, before faith came, we were allowed no freedom by the law. We were being looked after till faith was revealed. The law was to be our guardian until the Christ come, came and we could be ju justified by faith. Now that that time has come, we are no longer under that guardian, and you are all of you sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. All Baptist, uh, baptized in Christ, you have all clothed yourselves in Christ, and there are no more distinctions between Jew and Greek, slave and free, male and female, but all of you are one in Christ Jesus, merely by belonging to the Christ. You are the um, posterity of Abraham, the heirs he was promised. So Moltmann takes this reading against Bloch's charge that this idea of Christianity, that this was just nationalistic, uh, national socialistic Volksgemeinschaft, and that the Christian Gemeinschaft was something very different. And that, in a certain sense, Gibbon and then Hitler were right when they thought that Christianity was the Bolshevism of the of Roman Empire and that it destroyed the Roman Empire by dissolving the slaveholder system. <clears throat> and therefore, of course, Hitler had to attack the uh, Bolshevists, now the heirs of Christianity, 
because they would, through their idea of equality, uh, destroy humanity. That was behind the project uh, um, against Russia, uh, where four million men, all baptized, marched into Russia and killed 26 million Russians and six million Jews. The Jewish scholar Bloch remembered that what Moltmann had presented as Paul's classless community had been called only 22 years earlier in fascist Germany, Volksgemeinschaft or national community, which was to reconcile the antagonism between workers and bourgeoisie in civil society and between the genders, but not the discrepancy between the races, of course, the Semites and the Aryans. I had lived in this fascist Volksgemeinschaft for 12 years. National socialism was much more nationalism than socialism. Capitalism as private appropriation of collective labor remained preserved, and so was the German class system. Hitler made sure that this would be the case even after him by initiating 1943 a committee under Ludwig Erhard, the later West German economic minister and chancellor, to prepare a currency reform which would accomplish this job. While Ernst Röhm, the leader of the SA and Strasser Brothers, opened um, Brothers opted for the nationalization of the industry, Hitler was against it and befriended himself with the capitalist ruling class, which paid him as well as with the generals from the nobility and the bourgeoisie who fought for him. Ford, Cope, Thyssen, IBM, and so on and so on, General Rundstedt, General Rommel, and Count of Stauffenberg even, and the officers who conspired with him in the assassination attempt against Hitler. Röhm and Strasser brothers were assassinated by the SS. When the Gauleiter of Hessen took my fee away from the Lessing, for the Lessing Gymnasium because of my anti-fascist statements, and my mother could not pay for it, the director of her shoe factory, uh, Schneider in Frankfurt, which had been expropriated from the Jewish owners by the fascist state, paid for it so that I was, as a token proletarian, could continue to go to the bourgeois elite school. But the fascist Volksgemeinschaft was, to a large extent, appearance, ideology, untruth. It is that certainly for the critical theory of religion, which witnesses today a new shift from democratic cosmopolitanism to anti-democratic communitarianism in Europe and America. Trumpism, while nationalism and racism, right-wing identity politics, Authoritarian populism, fascism, neo Nazism, right wing identitarian pressure groups, right wing, and so on and so on. It would nevertheless be interesting to follow the suggestion of Walter Dix, who fought fascism from its very start, and explore how much socialism was really realized in national socialism and to what extent the Volksgemeinschaft was not a fraud and to what extent disparities in German civil society were really reconciled by Hitler's authoritarian state. Some people are still in Germany dreaming of this Volksgemeinschaft. Jürgen Moltmann, who had also experienced the fascist Volksgemeinschaft, contradicted Bloch, who had been in American exile during World War II, like the critical theorist of society and the International Institute for Social Research, um, for him, Paul's primordial Christian community was not a fascist Volksgemeinschaft, but broke all communitarian Volksgemeinschaften, which existed in the late Roman Empire. According to Moltmann, the Pauline community was the first international cosmopolitan association because there were no borders, which it did not blow up, blast or break up. To the view of the Christian, uh, um, of the critical theory of religion, Pope Francis was right when he called the wall building at the southern U.S. border by communitarian President Trump unchristian in spite of the fact that the latter considers himself to be a most devoted Presbyterian Christian. However, the Lutheran theologian Moltmann remembered that with Martin Luther, another thought appeared during the Reformation, that namely with the cross of Christ was connected Christ's journey into hell, and that in the hell of the loss of God and God forsakenness of the absolute negative, Christ was there 
and that gave Luther occasion to hope even in the hell. Thus, here with Luther, hell was penetrated by hope, as the crucified was striding through this hell. It seemed to Moltmann that here the hope was catching fire, not only from the negative, the meon, but in the midst and under the power of the negative, the ukon, the evil negative. For his opponent Bloch, it was all right that Christ had been striding through hell, but Bloch insisted that the punishment of hell were eternal, <clears throat> not for Jesus alone, who came into the hell only for a visit. The punishment of hell were not eternal. But Moltmann insisted, nevertheless, that the punishment of hell were no longer eternal. Moltmann remembered that the Protestant composer Paul Gerhardt had expressed that truth beautifully in an Easter song, Christ did not go into hell in order to uh, uh, into spare other people, as Persa, as Bloch had said, who paid uh, interim payments for the sins of the people. But he tears through the death, through the word, through the need and want, he pulls through the hell. I am always his fellow. The um, Paul, that Paul Gerhardt song meant for Moltmann, the Christian is spared nothing. Also, not the hell, but he can go through it on the side of his fellow, Christ Jesus. There has been room in the critical theory for both, the Christian Moltmann and the Marxist Bloch. The sacred and the profane and their conflicting teachings have been most useful for the critical theory of religion throughout its evolution from 1946 to today. <clears throat> for my friend, the liberal Catholic theologian Hans Küng, and from the Protestant existential political theologian Paul Tillich, the critical theory has learned that the bar God above the God, who went under in doubt and despair, does not punish any human being on earth or in hell, but that men and women do only punish themselves through their own wrong ideas, values, motivations, decisions, and actions. Today, two years ago, when his Kairos came, on September 19, 200, 2017, at 10 o'clock in the morning, our beloved son, Steve, a labor lawyer, had to move into the nothingness, the ukon, of a premature terrible cancer death as a member of the homosexual community and with Christ Jesus, the fellow, in the words of Gerhard, in whom he had been baptized and whom he Im imitated in faith and in many beautiful good works for family, civil society, and state. Throughout his short life, following his dear mother's Margaret, mother of eight children, who preceded him into nothingness, Uk on, equally faithful and brave through her equally horrible cancer death, 40 years earlier, both being buried now on the Mountain Home Cemetery in Kalamazoo, Michigan, in the family grave, under the rose of reason in the cross of the present. Thank you. What I'm going to be talking about is Laudato Si and social theory, developing Catholic social teaching alongside critical cultural critique. Sort of the vein of reasoning that I'm looking uh, at through this paper is one that tries to find a saying the same thing, which is a fairly standard conflict resolution style or technique. So there might be, perhaps, if there are any critiques here, they might be along the lines of gilding over some particularities within Catholic social teaching and also critical social theory. Um, and that's probably true. <laughs> but essentially, the, the philosophy of what I'm trying to do with this paper is to be able to say there are some similarities between these two ways of thinking. And if anything, this serves as perhaps as what they might call in film theory and also counseling theory, a suspension of disbelief when one comes to a, a difference in thought, as there sometimes is between especially Catholics looking at social theory, um, to be able to find some common ground, as it were. So let's begin. What hath Frankfurt to do with Rome? Social theory inherently critiques systems of power, often power wrapped in religious vestiges and vestments. However, our world has already launched off into the treacherous journey to Ithaca. Odysseus and Circe have found each other at odds. <laughs> 
Therefore, since we live in the world as it is, we must engage in the realm of, quote, the fundamental paradox of all ontological questioning, as Adorno states. The two potentially paradoxical partners in conversation for this paper are the exchanges between social theory and Roman Catholic teaching. Though such associations are not without historical precedent, as seen in the dialectic dialogue between Habermas and Ratzinger. The goal of this paper is to first instantiate social theory as an acceptable means of inquiry by which Roman Catholics may engage with modern culture by breaking down potential issues which may cause Catholics to potentially write off, disregard, or anathematize the work of social theory. And second, to demonstrate this to be the case by examining environmental issues in the world as expounded upon by the church, particularly within the recent papal encyclical by Pope Francis, by highlighting the common ground shared between Catholic social teaching and social theory. Therefore, from this standpoint positioning, this paper attempts to vindicate or justify the use of social theory to Roman Catholics. The line of inquiry this paper will seek to be, or to seek to find, will be ironic, that is, that I hope to be aware of both the harsh critiques to and from each side, as it were, versus the other, and that there are certainly foundational issues between the Catholic and beatific vision compared to how some Catholics might view a Frankfurt School design. But knowing that these interlocutors may not negate the other in their entirety uh, is something worth further explanation and encounter progress which cannot be easily made without dialogue such as this. To that end, this paper will focus on tracing the similarities and agreement in thought, noting the potentiality for aid, goodwill, and explanatory power each viewpoint may offer the other. Further, this paper will cover only cover each perspective's differences to the end of requiring a suspension of disbelief of the other, hopefully mitigating a sense of hypercriticism. So Article 1, Question 1, whether social theory is an acceptable critical standpoint for Catholic audiences. It is important to establish whether or not social theory generally is specifically allowable or on a safe source for, or found as a safe source for Catholic audiences. Obviously, books uh, that are banned uh, are no longer really operated uh, upon in Catholic circles today, but in popular level discourse, especially by those potentially misinformed by um, critical theory, potentially, does for some find itself relegated to the criticisms of broad brush social movements, often groups which may broadly critique movements such as, quote, social justice warriorism or, quote, cultural Marxism, a term is certainly not used by those who actually do discourse analysis in these camps. For example, see a recent book by Michael Walsh in The Devil's Pleasure Palace, The Cult of, of Critical Theory and the Subversion of the West, or several essays in the recent Linda Rose book, What Are They Teaching the Children? Especially those which slip into the quote, conspiratorial by Anthony Busk uh, or Alistair Noble. So some of these potential issues may be addressed in two ways. First, by attempting to establish a base plausibility structure and to encourage an open mind to admit alternative or potentially perceived to be explanations for the current state of the world, in this case, social theory. And secondly, then, by understanding clear statements made by the church concerning the acceptability of social theory. Again, here using the word church as uh, broadly the Roman Catholic Church or Roman Catholics. Let's talk about the plausibility structures for Catholic, the Catholic potential for social theory. So first, what should be addressed in a generalized issue among some concerning the issues brought on by movements associated with what is considered to be progressive, lumping social theory into these groups. Perhaps something of the, quote, postmodern effect has taken place within many conservative circles. That is the understanding that postmodernism has done something to break off potential teaching within the church, it's often what's considered to be against church the uh, teaching, uh, generally from a traditionalist lens, is often just considered to be postmodern. That is to say, issues, concerns, or movements that are sometimes considered to be anti-Christian are grouped within this same camp. It should be noted that it seems to be part and parcel for some groups that um, there is an in-group, out-group dynamic that often takes place. And potentially, if something has been tagged accurately or inaccur inaccurately, something may not be admitted to a particular worldview. And so following a particular train of reasoning, even, even if it uses some of the same sources, this may still be considered to be incompatible by some. And therefore, conversations in that vein may not be productive. However, on the other hand, movement may be possible for some to come to an understanding that social theory does not have to be considered to be against church teaching by default. A few safe 
safe Catholic authors may be used to describe a particular Catholic view to the world, which should be able to accept and be bolstered by thought, philosophies, and movements which may, on the surface, appear to be in initially incompatible to a popular level audience. Charles Taylor, for instance, describes how a Catholic vision of the world should be one characterized by, quote, a fundamental yes saying towards wider culture. To put it another way, Taylor believes that while the sacramental vision of Catholicism may provide potential benefits to society and the world in general, specifically for Catholic by Catholicism, Taylor does not believe that for modern Catholics, the default way of being or position towards non-ecclesiastical ideas should be one of automatic negation. In fact, he believes that the modern moral order is one from which Catholics can learn from, taking a vantage point towards a willingness to learn a receptive outlook. And of course, Taylor uses that to describe uh, modern ethics in general, not specifically critical ethics found in social theory, which again, may actually be on the surface as well, more compatible to popular Catholics. Of course, this desire to bring these thoughts together should not be to subsume other ways of thinking, to engage in supersessionism, as it were. Um, uh, but there are streams within Catholic thought, such as liberation theology or Catholic feminist theology, which are able to bring these different movements together. In any case, uh, a case should be made that Catholics cannot just be selective from within the tradition, from where they might draw their thinking. Plato, of course, was a pagan from the Christian lens and is now considered to be a default perspective. So what counts as within the tradition in today's time? Especially as outlined in documents from Vatican II, there should be less of an interpretation against what has been considered to be a position of conquest and supremacy. Next, uh, Romano Guardini, a Roman Catholic Monsignor who was contemporaries with theologians such as Pieper, Balthazar, de Lubac, also maintains a position of openness towards the world as well. In spite of technology's hyper-invasive influence in the 20th century, as he discusses in his book on Lake Como, Guardini believed that Catholic thought could provide answers and comfort to those who felt alienated from their work and their humanity on account of this age of mechanical reproduction. <coughs> Looking back at his childhood at Lake Como, with a grown-up gaze of seeing the nostalgic green landscape replaced and besmirched by factories and smokestacks, he maintained his ability to continue this yes saying. And here's what he says. We must say yes to our age. We cannot solve the problem or problems by simply seeking to alter or improve. Rather, immersion, not standoff attitudes or constant suspicion, is what Gardini calls Catholics to do. Not only could his critiques of technology be similar in some ways to one might find in social theory, but Catholics looking to emulate the Monsignor may take up this invitation to immersion and take a second look at what the likes of Adorno, Horkheimer, Benjamin, and more have to offer. So next we'll talk about the church's wider acceptance of social theory itself. So perhaps not the first choice for Catholics whose preferences may lie in Thomism, patristics, or natu natural law, it is the case that social theory may find itself within the tradition. Various documents and movements may be explored, beginning with papal writings concer concerning this critical and political theory. The most straightforward and uh, complementary engagement with social theory is found in Benedict XVI's 2000 encyclical, Spe Salvi. In it, Benedict takes on the Kantian and Baconian eschatological visions of triumph over nature, stamping the scientists, the scientism's worldview with critiques not dissimilar to what might be found in the dialectic of enlightenment, for instance. Certainly the Pope has read his Marx, Horkheimer, and Adorno and speaks very highly of them. He says, a revolutionary leap was needed. Karl Marx took up the rallying call and applied his incisive language and intellect to the task of launching this major new work. And as he thought, a definitive step towards in history towards salvation. With further praise, Benedict states, this is a longer quote, with great precision, Marx described the situation of his time. And with great analytical skill, he spelled out the paths leading to revolution. And not only theoretically, he set it in motion. His promise, owing to the acute, uh, acuteness of his analysis and his clear indication of the means for radical change, was and still remains an endless source of fascination. Certainly the Pope has his criticisms of Marx, but he demonstrates an understanding, or perhaps need, for the fellow German interlocutor. Space Salvi continues in this thread by examining today's world in light of the results of modernity and the church. What tool does the Pope use for self-critique? Here he does not reach back to principles laid by Augustine or Cyprian, but rather to the Frankfurt School. And I quote, a self-critique of modernity is needed in dialogue with Christianity and its concept of hope. In this dialogue, Christians too, in the context of their knowledge and experience, must learn anew in what their hope truly consists, what they have to offer to the world. 
and what they cannot offer. Flowing into this self-critique of the modern age, there also has to be a self-critique of modern Christianity, which must constantly renew itself in self-understanding, setting out from its roots. This renewal, according to the next paragraphs of the encyclical, cites Adorno throughout. Benedict even links the professor's analysis to St. Paul's own in the epistles to the Ephesians and Corinthians. Horkheimer is examined as one who shines light on the extremes of Christian iconoclasm or idolatry, rejections of the Decalogue by negating the presence of God in nature or in creating gods in one's own image. In short, Benedict uses the thought of the Frankfurt School to extend the range of Catholic social teaching. It would be one thing for the Pope to cite these authors here and there in personal works, as he does do in the popular level Jesus of Nazareth, but it is certainly a statement of considerable weight to include social theory as a key conversational partner in the in official Roman Catholic teaching and an encyclical. There are many other examples, for example, though perhaps Space Salvi is most telling from a hierarchical perspective. Professor Siebert points out, points out that Karl Rahner, Hans Küng, uh, Metz, uh, and Skilbex, and many others engaged in various sources in critical theory, various sources of critical theory. And while their bishops themselves may not have interacted with these primary sources, their resultant pastoral leadership reflected the Catholic secondary sources from the primary sources of the Frankfurt School. And that then leads us to reading Laudato Si in an, an attempt to bridge the gap. Laudato Si on the care for our common home, which is uh, in Latin, praise, to, praise be to you from uh, St. Francis of Assisi's Canticle of the Sun, was written by the current uh, Roman pontiff, Pope Francis in 2015, and is often referred to as the environmental encyclical. That this is not an entirely about climate and ecology, a great deal of the focus of Francis is upon the systems and structures that allow for or even promote the utilitarian consumption of the planet. Therefore, Francis critiques consumeristic throwaway cultures, paragraphs 20 through 22, radical imbalances of power, paragraph 26, the influence of, quote, media and the digital world, paragraph 47, and the technocratic paradigm, paragraph 109. Very clearly, Francis is very concerned with the dangers presented in this world, present from advertising and marketing, hypercapitalism and more, and therefore shares many critiques found in social and critical theory, especially those which are concerned about the environment or those concerned with the problems of mass production. To demonstrate this, various selections from Laudato Si will be presented with brief commentary given concerning the relevance of this document to critical theory and vice versa. So first on consumerism. Francis understands consumerism in the following ways. It is promoted by the market. It is often needless in some ways. It, citing Gardini, is inflicted on us by, quote, patterns of machine production and of abstract planning. It interprets human freedom to, to be freedom to consume and is bereft of social or ecological awareness, quote from paragraph 219. However, the Pope states that what can break a community out of indifference is just that, a focus on community, characterized by small gestures of mutual care, shared mutual identities, and stories which can be handled on, handed on, paragraph 232. Regarding a community's re recollection or recollection of a shared identity, Adorno shares thoughts on his German background in the meaning of working through the past. In one sense, one wishes to avoid calling to remembrance atrocities, violence, and villainy. However, the, quote, loss of history, as he states, indicating this negativity by connecting it to the work of Goethe's Satan and Faust, is one which leads to negative societal outcomes, either from remembering the past so that one doesn't repeat its mistakes, or, that one, or so that one can revivify the mythoi of the past in an honest way. In this work, Dorno does, does spend more time critiquing the German malaise of his time, but such a critique could be considered an open door for Francis's reconstructive goals, potentially critiquing what is considered to be establishment Catholic teaching on what may support hyper-consumerism. Next, a critique of power. It is in regard to critiques of power that Metz channeling Marx appears in this letter, since according to the theologian, all suffering in this world concerns each person in the world, one must pay attention to where suffering culminates or where it is directed to. Those in the working class or those with no ability to maintain by any means, um, any means by which they may rise up from deleterious environments. Francis continues this liberational stream by pointing out the Catholic ideal of, quote, the preferential option for the poor, which is often met with powerful opposition by those in power. He says, quote, Many of those who possess more resources and economic or political power seem mostly to be concerned with masking the problems or concealing their symptoms simply by making efforts to reduce some of the negative impacts, the negative results of their power production. 
Of course, we could probably go on with, with power, but I think we'll just skip ahead a little bit to digital media and the technocratic paradigm. Even in a culture where there is a wider awareness of the problems in this world, consumerism, environmental issues, and so forth, Francis discusses the fact that these issues, the awareness of these issues, tend not to take center stage even if they appear on things such as social media. He states, quote, many professionals, opinion makers, communications, uh, com communications media and centers of power being located in affluent urban areas are far removed from the poor with little direct contact with their problems. They live and reason from the comfortable position of a high level of development and quality of life well beyond the reach of the majority of the world's population. This lack of physical contact and encounter, encouraged at times by the disintegration of our cities, can lead to a numbing of conscience and to um, and tends to analyses which neglect parts of reality. It's paragraph 49 of Laudato Si. This analysis is multifaceted multifaceted and is aligned in many ways to the works of the Frankfurt School. Cannon and Cushman rightly point out that critics refer to this encyclical as being characterized by, in some ways negatively, by reactionism, but also by anti-modernism and anti-capitalism, perhaps having to do with this, quote, alternative paradigm proposed by the Pope. What he seems to be arguing for here uh, is against a perceived and unexamined, uh, unexamined default good of, quote, greater awareness. The more we can be aware of societal bads, the more that this brute knowledge will inspire us to act towards societal goods. However, this doesn't work that way. Connerton summarizes Habermas as an interlocutor about this very issue, stating that, quote, self-awareness can never arise out of isolation, as it does with these affluent urban areas. It comes through acts of reciprocity. The problem with digital media is that we, quote, live and reason from comfortable positions, as the Pope states, while being entertained or sedated on a comfortable flow of information about the problems in the world. Of course, this does nothing to stem the tide of actual issues, and rather hamstrings those who may have been potential actors by addictions to their social media, by interruptions from advertisements, or by a skewed sense of the problems in the world as a result of stilted algorithms, search engine results pages, or news feeds biased by purposeful self-selection. Technologists of today's time may have, them, may have themselves been enraptured by a, quote, theology of domination, a sore subject and certainly a particular doctrine sometimes adopted by Catholics, which is one that is in of itself critiqued by Marx, Adorno, and Marcuse with an instrumental rationality imported from our time into the prelapsarian state. Francis seeks to contribute something new here, describing participation, not use, in the world, stating that, quote, in paragraph 89, all things are linked by unseen bonds and together form a kind of universal family, a sublime communion, which fills us with a sacred, affectionate, and humble respect. Such language, universal family and sublime communion, may be helpful as adopted by both Catholics and social theorists. Another term that may be helpful is his use of the technocratic paradigm, which is fairly self-explanatory and yet is able to encapsulate within itself a definition of things which are often critiqued. The technocratic paradigm, as he refers to it, is essentially this idea that um, the paradigm of the modern world is one that is focused on technocracy, a sort of transhumanism that forgets the human. Uh, let's wrap up. It's 1050. Uh, let me just jump to the conclusion here. By examining the statements made by various writers and thinkers in the Catholic Church, and by examining the worldview of Catholicism as one which holds a potentiality for yes-saying, especially in regards to critiques concerning society, culture, and politics, one can, one can conclude that social theory, even though some aspects may be appraised to be incomplete by those voices in the Catholic Church, yet it is still an acceptable foundation from which to evaluate human endeavors. With this lens, one may view social theory as an effective conversation partner, and when viewing certain documents as well, such as papal encyclicals, as themselves contributing to social theory. At the beginning of the encyclical, Pope Francis states that the ecological, social, and political issues addressed in Laudato Si, quote, echo the reflections of numerous scientists, philosophers, theologians, and civic groups, all of which have enriched the church's thinking on these questions. Further, quote, outside the Catholic Church, other churches and Christian communities and other religions have well, as well, have expressed deep concern and offered valuable reflections on issues which all of us find disturbing. This is from paragraph seven, obviously very early on in the encyclical. So from the outset of the document, the Pope seeks to engage with the work done by a myriad of groups who can provide insights into the issues facing our times. 
While he does not specifically mention social theorists by name in paragraph seven, it is no stretch to assume the insights offered by social theory may be included in this body of evidence that may be used to conclude that culture is in drastic need of drastic change. In the spirit of critique, concerns similar to those presented by Marx, Horkheimer, uh, Adorno, Lukács, uh, Faber, and many others find their resonance in Francis's recent writing. As such, writings from both Rome and Frankfurt may work together to address these global issues. I think I'll close up there. Thank you.